good afternoon. If you're uh, on the West Coast, good evening. If you're on the East Coast, good morning. If you're in Taiwan, it's our uh, pleasure to uh, welcome you to this special session on the dynamics of democracy in Taiwan, the Ma Ying Zhou years, which is the title of a book we recently produced um, and are going to partially reproduce for you here in panel form. Uh, I am uh, Larry Diamond. I'm the chair of our program on Taiwan in the Indo-Pacific region here at the Hoover Institution. It's my pleasure to welcome you to once again thank um, our sponsor and um, a friend, uh, the Taipei Economic and Cultural Office in San Francisco for their support of our program. And to introduce to you someone who I think is probably well known to everyone, uh, uh, certainly on our panel, but probably almost everyone in our audience, really one of the leading scholars now uh, of Taiwan's democracy, its society, its political system, and its national security, Dr. Karis Templeman. Many of you uh, will know that uh, Karos uh, was the program manager for the Taiwan uh, Democracy and Security Program as it um, existed previously at the Freeman Spogli Institute. And we feel uh, very privileged now to welcome him back as a visiting scholar at the Hoover Institution and uh, to take the reins again of uh, working with me uh, in giving uh, uh, administrative and intellectual direction to this program now on Taiwan in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, Karis is one of the leading scholars of Taiwan's politics uh, and one of the contributors to this book we're going to be discussing today on uh, the dynamics of democracy in, in Taiwan. So Karis, uh, Welcome back uh, to the Taiwan program and your leadership role. Welcome to the Hoover Institution and your role here. Uh, and I turn the program over to you. All right. Well, thank you very much, Larry, for uh, having me here. And uh, for it's a, it's a delight to be back as part of the Taiwan project, now reincarnated over at the Hoover Institution. Um, it's also a delight to uh, be able to introduce our three wonderful speakers today. Uh, before I do that, I do want to say a few words about our new book. Uh, this came out uh, earlier this year. Uh, you can get a copy. It's from Lynn Reiner Publishing. Uh, it's available in paperback, hardback, and uh, there's an ebook version as well. So I encourage you, uh, if you're at all interested in this topic, to check out our book uh, from Lynn Reiner Publishing. Um, I want to say a few words about the book in which they have a chapter. The title is uh, Dynamics of Democracy in Taiwan, the Ma Yingzhou Years. And as the title suggests, it covers uh, the politics of Taiwan uh, for the eight years of the Ma Yingzhou presidency from 2008 to 2016. Uh, as the book details, uh, there are 16 chapters in this book, and it, it clocks in, at, I believe, over 400 pages. So it's quite, uh, quite a detailed uh, analysis of the Ma years. Uh, this was an era of contradictions. Uh, in 2008, Ma Yingzhou won the largest vote share that a presidential candidate has ever recorded in Taiwan. He won over 58% of the vote even higher than Tsai Ing-wen won in January of this year. Uh, he also has the dubious distinction of recording the lowest uh, public approval rating uh, in modern Taiwanese history. In 2014, one survey put his rating at an abysmal 9%. Uh, so he's had both the highest of highs and the lowest of lows over Taiwan's, uh, over his eight years in office. Um, likewise, the economy in, tai in Taiwan during Ma ying two terms in office, uh, went through both the deepest economic recession in Taiwan's modern history and recorded the highest growth rates of the last three decades. Uh, Ma's Chinese Nationalist Party, or Kuomintang, or KMT, held a large majority in the Taiwanese legislature for both of his two terms in office. Uh, and yet, as we'll hear from one of our speakers, many of his administration's top priorities were repeatedly delayed or watered down or just outright blocked there. 
Uh, so one party control of the legislature and the executive does not mean that the president gets whatever he wants in Taiwan. Uh, public opinion data from this era also shows some contradictions. Uh, well, democratic values and rejection of authoritarian alternatives continued to deepen in Taiwan as the public opinion data in this book show. Ma also presided over a significant decline in trust in democratic institutions. So that by the end of the Ma Yingzhou era, the only public institution that had the trust of a majority of Taiwanese was the police, the national civil service, the legislature, certainly the political parties all recorded much, much lower levels of trust. Um, finally, economic and people to people exchanges with the People's Republic of China increased dramatically during Ma's two terms in office. Uh, but at the same time, a larger share of Taiwanese than ever before identified in public opinion surveys as exclusively Taiwanese, not Chinese and not Taiwanese and Chinese. Um, and so while Ma Yingzhou presided over the best relations with Beijing a Taiwanese government has had in at least a quarter century and perhaps arguably ever, uh, and while Ma was able to meet on an equal basis with uh, Chinese Communist Party General Secretary Xi Jinping in November of 2015, that was only five years ago, it's hard to believe. Um, at the same time, his cross-strait policies triggered a domestic political backlash. And as we document in the book, this backlash included a student-led occupation of Taiwan's legislature. It effectively halted uh, Ma's signature second-term policy, a cross-strait deal with uh, the mainland, it blocked further rapprochement, and it left the KMT itself bruised, battered, and badly beaten in the 2016 elections. That set of elections then swept in the current president, Tsai Ing-wen and her Democratic Progressive Party into power, a position that they retained in January 2020 and that they will hold for at least four more years. So the Mai era was really kind of a turning point in Taiwanese uh, political party and electoral history. Um, and so we've d drilled down quite a bit in this book uh, to provide a deeper look at many of the contradictions of this era. And there are four, four big areas, party politics and elections, uh, democratic institutions and governance, public opinion and civil society, and cross-strait and foreign relations. And we're fortunate today to have people uh, contributors to the book able to speak about three of these areas. Uh, I would love to have all the con contributors to this book talk, but we'd be here until midnight. So uh, we've, we've limited ourselves to three and I'm proud to highlight their contributions today. So first we will hear from uh, Dr. Cillian Ho. Dr. Ho is a faculty member at uh, Danjiang University in Danshui, New Taipei. Uh, he is a professor in the Graduate Institute of Strategic and International Affairs there. Uh, he notably and importantly for this talk also served as the Deputy Secretary General of President Ma's first National Security Council. And from that experience, he is able to provide us an insider's account of how, the President, uh, how President Ma's team went about their efforts to foster Ma's signature uh, achievement, his uh, rapprochement with Beijing. Uh, next, we'll hear from Dr. Austin Wong. Dr. Wong is an assistant professor of political science at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. And he has published a flurry of recent work on various aspects of Taiwan politics. Uh, those include work on public opinion, voting behavior, elections, and party politics. And it's the last that he's going to speak about today. He'll talk about the DPP's resurgence during the Ma era and Tsai Ing-wen's rise to power. Uh, notably, he is also one of the founders of the political science blog, Zheng Zhe Tai Shi Chang, or Political Marketplace in Taiwan, which much like if you're familiar with the monkey cage uh, that's now part of the Washington Post is intended to make political science research findings accessible to a general interest audience in Taiwan. Uh, finally, we'll hear from Shi Hao Huang. 
Uh, Dr. Huang is a postdoctoral research fellow at National Zhengzhou University in Taipei, Taiwan. And among his research interests, he is, I would say, this is not an exaggeration, he's one of the most, the foremost experts on Taiwan's legislature, or Li Fa Yuan. And uh, he has amassed a wealth of data on legislative bills that he has presented for the first time in print in our book. And uh, so one of the most original and compelling chapters of the book, I think, is, is the work that he has done with um, Shen Xingyuan, another professor at Zhengzhou Dashui. Um, so we'll look to him to explain to us why President Ma had so much trouble with the legislature during his two terms in office. Uh, so I've asked uh, each of the speakers to talk for about 10 minutes, uh, and then we'll save some time for Q&A. Uh, once they're all done speaking, we'll have about 20 minutes for that. Uh, please do take advantage of the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to submit questions to us. I'll moderate those questions uh, as we uh, engage in the discussion. Uh, so without further ado, I will turn the floor over to Dr. He. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is uh, my first uh, Zoom conference. Uh, the surrounding of me is so familiar. Well, this is my study, but uh, the uh, conference surrounding is uh, so strange for me. Uh, well, thanks to the uh, pandemic. <clears throat> Let me share some of my thoughts uh, on cross-strait relations. Uh, then, that is uh, uh, my angels uh, eight years and now. Uh, well, actually, now my uh, personal fear, I emphasize personal, now, my personal fear now, of Taiwan now, being somehow uh, harassed or attacked now, by China now, reached a crescendo now, in November 13 now, this year, just now. And uh, it was largely because now, uh, President elect, elect Biden now, was denied until then. Now, the uh, presidential uh, daily briefing on national security matters. Now, that was, to me, a, a very, very serious concern. Now. And uh, actually, now, my thinking was, now, and uh, still is now, now uh, here, now, Taiwan stand, stands right before a window of uh, vulnerability. Now. Uh, the window of vulnerability constitutes uh, on part of America. Uh, Taiwan certainly uh, very much relies on uh, American uh, political and uh, to a considerable degree uh, military support uh, for Taiwan should there be an attack uh, from uh, China. Uh. But the U.S. right now is, uh, I would say, very weak. Uh, uh, look at the, the uh, pandemic spread and uh, look at uh, the uh, worrisome signs of uh, economic decline. And uh, I was, and still, as I said, and, uh, concerned, or uh, I'm very, very much concerned of uh, the lack of uh, a central command, and, uh, that is the presidential leadership. And, uh, in this situation. Uh, so Taiwan's really you know, stand is really, really you know, is facing a window of vulnerability you now. And uh, put this you know, in a sharp relief of uh, President Ma's uh, eight years, you know, where, as you just mentioned, Carl, uh, as you just mentioned, you know, the Russian rapprochement you know, reached a, a high point. You know, for the past, uh, well, uh, well uh, since uh, 1949, uh, if not 1970, uh, well, since 1972, uh, if not 1949. Uh. So uh, <clears throat> uh, let me uh, let me go back uh, to my uh, chapters, and then uh, I will uh, dash back uh, to the uh, current situation uh, uh, to compare uh, the two uh, presidencies. Uh, so far now. Uh, my chapter now is basically about uh, uh, my angel's uh, practice of the 92 consensus. Uh, I do not have to uh, elaborate too much you know, on this uh, concept. You know. 
uh, because uh, it's uh, it's uh, semantically, syntactically, and uh, linguistically too complicated. And, uh, well, let me put it this way. Now, this uh, was a very good uh, 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 slogan to summarize you know, what President Ma uh, had done uh, in his uh, eight years. Now, uh, my I have uh, I had uh, personally uh, involved in, uh, in this uh, process, and uh, together with um, your friend uh, uh, Dr. Su Qi, and uh, <clears throat> this is uh, what I wrote uh, in the chapter. Uh, was uh, both a uh, a uh, personal story uh, of uh, this whole thing, and a uh, a uh, public the public uh, uh, event uh, record, uh, and uh, the uh, basic idea of uh, using ninety two consensus, you know, was uh, our understanding by our I say uh, the national security, of course, you know, with the Ma sitting on top you know, of that organization, uh, understanding of uh, structure, international structure. By then, the uh, U.S. You know, was in <clears throat> good relations with uh, China. Uh, we understood that you know, uh, there were over 17 uh, direct channels you know, between these two great powers. You know. <clears throat> so uh, this is the basic understanding. And then uh, we then developed the operational modes developed a number of uh, nuts and the boats at the boats you know, uh, practices you know, uh, when it come to it came to uh, dealing deal with uh, uh, the two great powers you know. uh, of course you know, the uh, 92 consensus was uh, very much based on a liberal version of uh, 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 of understanding uh, of uh, international relations that is you know, uh, there could, if there were more exchanges, you know, uh, uh, the better, the safer you know, for Taiwan. You now we were hoping that you know, the United States, you know, uh, we were hope uh, the uh, China you know, could you know, understand Taiwan more uh, through tourism or through whatever exchange programs. And uh, we were, of course, you know, hoping that the United States you know, was uh, very, then Obama administration uh, uh, could be very supportive you know, of uh, our effort. You know. And uh, <clears throat> here, you now, this is uh, what I'm going to say is a little bit uh, uh, the personal uh, experience. You know, that was, you know, it was never easy you know, to strike a balance between the two great powers. You know. uh, Ma had signed the 23 agreements with China. Uh, and the US, of course, knew that you know, we were undergoing negotiations you know, in various kind, uh, uh, um, in various rounds. You know. And the US you know, was uh, always you know, blowing uh, uh, on the back of my neck, uh, asking me and the others, you know, uh, what was our progress? Now, the question became one for me and for others, you know, how much you know, we should let US know uh, before or after you know, the effect. You know? And we knew that, you know, uh, <clears throat> we knew that, you know, uh, well, sooner or, China, uh, sooner or later, you know, United States would know our progress. And uh, we couldn't tell US you know, too early, or too late. You know? Otherwise, you know, we would lose you know, the trust you know, from the United States, a, a very valuable asset you know, for Taiwan in dealing with China. On the other hand, you know, China you know, was also relentless you know, uh, in, in, uh, in asking us, you know, how could the US you know, be so supportive of uh, Mindjo's effort? You know? That was uh, <clears throat> that, that that was a lot of uh, balancing work you know, for the National Security Council, you know? and <clears throat> I would have to say you know, uh, the National Security Council you now would need uh, a sense of equi equilibrium, not necessarily uh, uh, a sense of balance. You know? Balance uh, 
in, in traditional international uh, relations literature now, has uh, more emphasis now on, on, uh, on military now, rather than on diplomacy. Now. So a sense of equilibrium uh, is important. Now. And then, uh, of course, now this sense of uh, equilibrium uh, uh, had to be applied uh, to domestic politics. Uh, and uh, I, as, as you just described uh, so succinctly, uh, uh, President Ma uh, didn't do quite well uh, in balancing uh, the domestic opinion. Uh, in my chapter, I described this as uh, uh, Taiwan uh, uh, having to play three uh, chesses, chess, uh, chess games. Uh, uh, the problem is one would influence the other two. Uh, so it was uh, quite complicated uh, for all of uh, the uh, National Security Council. Uh, okay. Uh, <clears throat> first thing back uh, to the current time. Uh, uh, the structure as I, uh, of international relations uh, had vastly changed you know, under uh, President Trump. You know. The U.S. You know, has has now regarded you know, China as a, a major rival, you know, if not the outright enemy you know, in the Cold War sense. You know. And uh, this you know, put a tremendous you know, strength you know, on uh, um, on, on, on Taiwan's uh, uh, dealing now uh, with the both uh, with uh, China, now. Uh, I have to say that now uh, it will be given current situation. Uh, I have to say that now uh, Ma, uh, if this is still under Ma administration, Ma would have to have. Uh, even more uh, dedicated or, uh, and sophisticated uh, approach uh, in dealing with China. This is, this is going to be a hard work uh, given the current uh, situation. Uh, this is the thing now. And uh, what I have seen uh, since uh, 2016 uh, uh, as a uh, rigidification or hardening uh, of uh, positions you know, on both the Taiwan and the China. Now, that pits Taiwan uh, against you know, a higher risk and uh, uncertainty you know, from uh, the Chinese uh, on the Chinese side. Uh, as President Tsai and the DPP government frequently told the Taiwan people that you know, Taiwan's relations you know, with America you know, has been the warmest you know, since 1972. And uh, that is very, very true. But at the same time, now, it's a relations you know, with the China now are not, are not very um, are not very cordial to say the least. Now. And uh, this is uh, the thing now, that that is a, a good relations with China uh, with the United States now, does not necessarily increase now, Taiwan's national security. Now. Uh, it has to be uh, the uh, the uh, again uh, the, the relations you know, Taiwan's relations you know, with these two great powers you know, just have to be balanced you know, uh, so as to increase you know, its uh, national uh, security you know. and uh, what. So Yin, you've got uh, just about a minute left. Yes, I saw I saw the chat and uh, no problem. Uh, there's one thing that uh, I didn't mention enough. Uh, well, actually, I didn't mention uh, uh, much uh, in my chapter. Uh, that is uh, demography. I have to say demography uh, made uh, Tsai Ing-wen's uh, uh, presidency, uh, largely because uh, she and the DPP had been very successful uh, uh, in mobilizing youth, you know, and uh, I think Austin uh, should uh, um, document this you know, very well. Uh, the new, when the new electors, you know, uh, when the new people you know, in the electorate you know, <clears throat> voted you know, for the uh, DPP, you know, the tendency you know, uh, probably you know, will continue. But on the other hand, you know, my thinking is you know, democracy you know, will, you know, I won't use the 
term uh, doom, uh, but I think it will pose tremendous uh, risk uh, to Taiwan's future. And uh, the reason is uh, twofold. One is economically. Now, uh, right now, now we have 72% of working people uh, as opposed to 28% of non-working people, meaning retired and those who are under um, 15 years old. Now. And uh, for every five years, now, the ratio now will decrease the ratio of working people will decrease by five to six percent, meaning that in 2030, now, we will have uh, only uh, uh, 65 to uh, roughly uh, 35 now. And in 2040, you, you can uh, calculate this yourself now. And then no economy now, is sustainable now uh, under this uh, demographic uh, decline. Now. No, none of it. And uh, none, none of them uh, can be sustainable economically. Secondly, uh, uh, economic, uh, uh, I mean, uh, demography, demographic decline uh, put a tremendous uh, strength uh, on Taiwan's uh, military. Uh, and uh, we just do not have uh, enough new recruits, recruits. This means uh, we will have to pay higher wage, higher salary uh, for those uh, who are willing uh, to uh, serve uh, in the military. And this uh, is not uh, uh, for both well uh, for Taiwan. Uh, if, it, if you look at American experience uh, of uh, volunteer, of having a all volunteer arm uh, uh, military, uh, you know uh, the cost. Uh, would be uh, astronomical. Uh, so uh, I think uh, the demography uh, will be uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the turning point, determining point uh, for Taiwan security uh, in the future. Okay, I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cillian. Uh, Austin, the floor is yours. Yeah, so I'm going to use slide to present my chapter. Yeah, okay, so here you are. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm Austin Wang, the assistant professor at the University of Nevada at Las Vegas. So today I'm going to have a brief introduction to, of my chapter in, the, in our book. So I'm to talk about what DPP had done in the, during the Ma era from 2008 to 2016. So first of all, let's look at the big picture, right? So what DPP had done in the, pre in the previous eight years. So maybe we can rephrase this question a little bit. So how did Tsai Ing-wen eventually bring DPP back to power, right? So if we look at, here are, I just present you the three election results, right? From 2008, DPP lose about 16%. All the way to the 2016, DPP won back and DPP got more votes compared to KMT 25%, which is a dramatic shift in terms of a vote share. Right. But if we look at other survey, well, just like the Professor Ho has said, the Taiwanese public opinion toward the close strike relationship did not change that much compared to the trend of, of full share. For example, if we look at this long term survey conducted by NCCU, ma majority of Taiwanese people still support the status quo during the eight years, during the Mar era. It's actually the amount of people who support independence it immediately even decreased during that period. Right. And also, if we look at the survey on the 1992 consensus that Professor Ho just mentioned, the majority of Taiwanese people that support 1992 consensus from 2008 all the way to 2018, the, the patterns suddenly just change right after, after 2019 when the China, China President Xi Jinping made the speech, New Year's speech about the 1992 consensus. Right. So, and, but also at the same time during this period, the majority of, of Taiwanese people gradually identify themselves as exclusive Taiwanese instead of the, instead of both or Chinese, right? But this this trip did not uh, always benefit Tsai because if we look at the campaign strategy made by um, Ma Ying-jeou and KMT, they also claim they are Taiwanese, right? They also put up the slogan about Taiwan and put the, the Taiwan's image in their slogan, right? So 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 what we can see is that. Well, the majority of Taiwanese people, they still support status quo. And at the same time, more Taiwanese people identify themselves as a Taiwanese, right? So if you are the chair of DPP in 2008, what, 
what kind of situation you should face and what kind of, of strategy you should use during this eight period, eight year period. Right? So in my chapter, I explained that there are four major factors that we can explain what the DPP and Tsai ing had done during this Ma era. The first is that how DPP then still interpret the 2008 fiasco. How, why did they lose so much, even though they just simply, they just got the majority in 2004, right? But it, then in 2008, everything changed, right? And, and it's, so is the first, how DPP, how DPP explain what happened in 2008? And second, how Tsai emerged? Right, because Tsai was not very popular in TPP in 2008, but how he how she eventually em emerged and uh, gradually centralized her power and presidentialized the whole DPP during this eight year, and how she presidentialized the DPP is strongly correlates with a, a special event which happened in 2012. In 2012, the uh, election central committee in Taiwan decided to hold the presidential election and the legislative legislative election on the same day. So they made it to be a concurrent election, which is a big deal for both Mind Zhou and Tsai Ing-wen because it totally changed the, the, the inter-party dynamic within TPP and within KMT. Right? And in the end, I want to talk a little bit about how TPP advanced in their communication technology during these eight years. Okay. So first of all, when DPP members are, were discussing about what happened in 2008, basically they summarized five points. The first is that DPP, they, they removed the blue pool, the Paila Mindel failed. It cannot choose the most competitive candidate. So it's the first problem. And the second is that the DPP lose its anti-corruption party brand. As we know, Chen shui he won the first presidency because he, not, he, he, he have a very strong brand that DPP is anti-corruption. But we know after 2008, because of a series of scandal, no matter you believe it or not, according to the survey, the majority of Taiwanese people, they no longer believe that DPP is an anti-corruption party. Yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's a big deal because if you don't have any party bread, how do you attract voters, especially the moderate voter? Right, so it's a second problem. And the third is that DPP focus too much on inter-faction competitions. We all know those big heads, they fought fiercely against each other before 2008. And in the end, no one win, right? And in the end, there's a discord between legislative and presidential campaign. We know that in 2008, the, uh, the Frank Scheer, he was a presidential candidate, so he had his own campaign. But the whole legislative elections in DPP was actually led by Chen shui right? So there's a discord and they compete, compete against each, each other on the newspaper. So it's also another fail, failure for DPP. And in the end, after 2008, DPP was under a huge debt. They don't have money even to maintain their website. So they just cancel their web website and move all their document to a free blog. Right? So, so you know DPP was, was under a huge problem in 2008. Right? So, how, so after 2008, they are going to elect a new chair, trying to solve all of these problems. So for the first two, two questions, so for the first two problems, they, ha they have a choice between different strategy. The first is that they can choose a more, much more moderate chair, right? And try to create a new brand that DPP is a moderate party, right? And the second group of people, they believe that DPP should go extreme, just like the Tea Party in the, in the, in the Republican, right? They argue that, well, people do, do not trust us because our party brand was not clear enough. We should go to extreme. We should be extremely support independent so that people will trust me, us again one day in the future, right? And for the third consensus, at least for the third point, at least all faction head, they make a consensus that no other faction, no faction head should run for the chair election at, at least in 2000, in, in 2000, right after 2008. Okay. And for the fourth and fifth, Point, they mentioned that they have to centralize the power to the chair somehow. And for the fifth, they need to elect someone who have enough financial support to the party at least, right? So in 2008, DPP chair election, there's a competition between Tsai Ing-wen and, and, and another candidate. Right? So, uh, so what is his name? Gu Xianrong, right? Nope. Guan Lu. 
Amit. Yeah, yeah, good call me. Yeah, good call me. I'm sorry. Yeah. And, and in the end, the majority of uh, DPP members that select Tsai Ing-wen, but Tsai Ing-wen only got 57% of vote, right? So as you know, so as you notice that at the beginning, Tsai Ing-wen was not very popular within the DPP, about, 40, about, about half of the DPP member, they, 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 they prefer Gu Kwame's approach, which can go extreme to make the Taiwan independent more salient in DPP. Right. Okay. Then another big issue is about 2012 uh, elections. In 2012, the Electoral Cent Central Committee decided to make the legislative election and the presidential election to be a concurrent election. And there's a huge, impact to both KNT and DPP, and especially among those legislative candidates. There's one study shows that in 2012, the amount of news coverage to those legis legislative candidates in Taiwan dropped 40%, right? And the percentage of the coverage for the presidential candidates increased a little bit, right? So if you were a legis legislative candidate, and you face, you face this concurrent election, what can you do? All you have to do, all you, all you can do is that you need to cooperate with the presidential candidate, right? And so it, it's a big deal because it helped both the DPP and KMT presidential candidates centralize their power. And they, they, so they will have a top-down campaigning model. They will ask all, all the legislative the, the, the candidates to run the campaign with the presidential candidates. So it's so it's during this process, it's a huge process for both KNT and, and DPP to have party presidentialization, which means that the whole party machine serves for the president. Okay. And at the same time, there are also some uh, internal reform within the DPP. The first is that the Tsai Ing-wen, he dropped this, removed the blue survey, and all of those, all, and now they all only rely on the simple survey, yeah, which means that they do not exclude any any respondent. And actually what I can tell you is that when Tsai Ing-wen made this, this decision, other big head in TPP, they did not oppose because they believe that other big faction head in TPP are much more famous compared to Tsai. So at the beginning, it, it, among many calculations among this uh, faction head, they believe they will defeat Tsai Ing-wen in the primary by using this simple survey. And as it come out, indeed the Su Zhen Chang, he actually, he almost won the nominations for, for the 2012 presidential uh, candidate to, to be nominated by the DPP for in 2012, right? So, so to, to a certain extent, that's how Tsai Ing-wen, you know, Tsai Ing-wen might be, uh, so I got a check, yeah, but I can't see that. So I will try to speed up a, a, a little bit, right? And another issue is that, well, the DPP make the nomination power back to the chair, especially for the PR list. And the third is that uh, those uh, declining uh, uh, faction, faction head that agree with the reform because they, they used to believe they have a chance to win under this reform. Okay. And the third is about some demographic change, wh which, I, which I think Professor Ho also mentioned. During this period from 2008 to 2012, there's a big shift for, about how people consume their information in Taiwan, especially more and more people start use smartphone. More and more people start use YouTube. YouTube was established in 2005. Facebook was established in 2008, right? So in 2009, Tsai Ing-wen established the internet department. Before that, the, this internet department propaganda was under the youth department. So now Tsai Ing-wen make it a, a distinguished department in, in DPP and try to folks put more resource on internet campaign. In 2005, this internet department was reformed to be a media and creative center. Then Tsai learned that experience when they borrow half of the staff in the internet, internet department to the Cohen Jones campaign. And then they learned a lot during the process. So they reformed the whole system to a media and creative center. And they focused mo most of their energy and resource to micro-targeting online. For example, in 2016, Tsai Ing-wen's campaign team, they create 80 different free deals for different group in Taiwan to, uh, to attract their phone. So that was made by the Media and Creative Center. So they focus more and more on the internet campaign. Okay. So these four factors are the main factor I discussed in the chapter, including how DPP interpret the 2008 failure, how Tsai become a parental optimum. He, she, she's moderate and so she's the second best option for all of the factions. 
And the third, how can current election influence the centralization of power within DPP all the way to this type? And in the end, the advanced in communication technology that, that made by the, the internet department and the media and creative center during this eight year. So that are the main point I can share about this chapter. And if you want to know more about what is happening after 2006, especially what is happening in 2008, 2020, and what will happen in 2022nd, then I can dis discuss it more during the QA session. And that's all I can share. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Austin. I will follow up with your future prognostications, definitely. <laughs> Maybe I'll have you give me stock advice as well. Um, uh, I will turn the floor over now to Shi Hao Huang, who will talk about uh, executive legislative relations. OK. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Shi Hao. Uh, I'm glad to be here. And uh, you can call me Isaac as well. Um, so I want to first give thanks to uh, Larry and Caris for organizing this event and uh, for publishing this book. So Professor Shen, Shen Xinyuan and I co-authored chapter seven in this book. So our chapter is about the legislative performance uh, during the Manjo years. So we present the legislative record uh, through the lens of uh, legislative organization. Although we do not deny that uh, party cohesion, seizure, legislative skills or other factors might play a certain role in determining the legislative outcome. Uh, we wanna highlight legislative organization as a structural factor that uh, have not received sufficient scholarly attention uh, when, we, when it comes to uh, legislative performance in Taiwan. So uh, legislative organization is the way which a parliament arranges uh, parliamentary affairs it decides the allocation of parliamentary power and rights among the legislative actors. So um, uh, the legislative actors we mean uh, is uh, include uh, the government, the parties, the, and individual legislators. So uh, in this chapter, we first uh, uh, show you that uh, uh, the legislative capacity of the government in Taiwan uh, is weaker than uh, what we have seen in our democracies. So uh, the government's weak legislative capacity is only the tip of the iceberg. So uh, Taiwan's policymaking performance uh, pre, uh, shows almost every syndrome of, uh, almost every textbook syndrome of uh, decentralized legislative organization, uh, including um, lack of order, chaotic policymaking, and uh, and uh, heavy workload and uh, uh, slow moving piecemeal policy changes and uh, uh, weak party, party discipline. And uh, uh, also we can have, we, we also have compromised and negotiated outcomes. And we also have uh, plenty access for particularistic interests to influence policy making. And then uh, we have equalized legislative capacity among the legislative actors. So, and finally, we have a low success rate. Uh, so combine all this together, uh, decentralized legislative, legislative organization prevents Taiwan from having a desirable, efficient policymaking process. And uh, uh, by contribute to uh, particularistic interests, particularistic politics and corruption. For example, so in recent case of corruption that occurred in Taiwan, you can see that uh, the owner of one private company pay a huge bribe to uh, individual legislator, two or three individual legislators. So think about that. Uh, if if uh, the individual legislator do not have any right to uh, enact bill or propose bill, why would any uh, private company or a particular interest group would pay a huge amount of money to individual legislators. So decentralized legislative organization not only weakens the uh, government's legislative capacity, uh, it also you know uh, foster uh, rent seeking or particular politics. So in chapter seven, uh, we present a procedural chart uh, that we believe is by far best to describe the uh, actual legislative process in Taiwan's parliament. 
And uh, with this chart, we show the, the static record stage by stage uh, from bill introduction to uh, committee stage to uh, uh, party negotiation mechanism. And then we also provide an analysis of the legislative outcome. So in that analysis, uh, we, pr we present that although the government can uh, enact several bills uh, during the major era, but uh, they, um, they, they, uh, they had to accept the uh, compromise the outcomes due to the uh, decentralized legislative, legislative organization. So uh, our chapter will give you a complete picture describing how the LY, the, part, the Taiwan's parliament actually worked during, during the uh, Ma Ying-jeou years. So uh, you can also observe the uh, implications from, uh, from decentralized legislative organization during the Taiwan years. So in the first turn of uh, Taiwan government, uh, they, uh, the DPP government enacted uh, several important partisan agenda, right? Uh, such as bills regarding uh, transitional justice, regarding uh, party access, regarding uh, same-sex marriage or pension reforms. Uh, but overall, uh, the enactment rate for the government bills was only about 63%, which was 5% uh, uh, higher than the mind your ears. So, uh, so even though they can strongly carry out some bills, but they cannot do so for you know thousands bill, hundreds bills, especially when each piece of legislation involves maybe hundreds of motions, procedural motions, or uh, amendments, or and then other members bills. So, uh, so they cannot if they have to you know vote on every bill and then uh, they have to pay a huge amount of mobilization and transition cost. So that's why uh, they can you know, strongly carry out some bills, but they cannot do so for every bill. So that's why we can see, we only see you know, 63% of the government bills inactive, but not 95% or 85%. Right? So, uh, in terms of the uh, members and caucus bills uh, in the uh, nice Yuan uh, from 2016 to 2020, and the KMT and DPP both enacted 30% of bill. And then the small party like uh, PFP and the NTP study down uh, also enacted uh, almost 30% of the bills, of their bills. So even though so, so you can still see the equalized legislative capacity across different legislative actors across different parties. So although the uh, DPP was much more a uh, cohesive majority party than the KMT, the decentralized legislative organization um, structurally, uh, structurally determined policymaking performance in Taiwan and it also uh, fundamentally cuts down the uh, capacity of the government. So I will end my presentation here. And then if you have any questions or issues, then we can discuss further later. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Shi Hao, for a great presentation. Um, so as you can see, we've got uh, a rich set of chapters in this book. I encourage you again, uh, if you just joined us to check out the book volume, Ty Dynamics of Democracy in Taiwan. Austin's got it too. Uh, the Ma Yingzhou Years. Ah, excellent. <laughs> um, so in the interest of time, what I'm going to do here now in our discussion is I'll go ahead and, and throw a set of questions at all three of our speakers. Um, and I'd invite the audience to weigh in with the Q&A button uh, on your screen. Go ahead and type your question there and then I'll come around for a second set of questions uh, once we've gotten through the first round. Um, so for Suyin, uh, I have uh, two questions for you uh, to consider. Uh, the first is um, one thing that comes through really strongly in your chapter is just how challenging diplomacy was even at the beginning of the Ma Yingzhou era with Beijing and just how hard you all had to work to use the right language, to 
proceed in the correct order, to communicate the right things to the public, uh, to the United States and to Beijing. And uh, that was under what I would say were ideal circumstances for cross-strait rapprochement. Both Beijing and Taipei were eager uh, and the United States was certainly supportive of the effort to improve cross-strait relations. Now we're in a much different world. There's, as you mentioned, hardening in Beijing. There's a much more suspicious view in the United States. And so I want to pose a hypothetical. Were the KMT to come back into power in 2024, if we had a KMT president again, uh, what would it be enough for that KMT president simply to say, I accept the 1992 consensus, let's pick up, let's party like it's 2008. Could we do that again? Or uh, are we in a different world where that sort of uh, creative diplomacy is just no longer effective? Um, the second question is uh, to have you talk just a briefly about what you think are the real lasting impacts of the Ma Yingzhou cross-strait policy. Some of the impacts, for instance, Ma's meeting with Xi Jinping, uh, a lot of people have forgotten about that already. It doesn't seem to have made a real uh, lasting impact, but others like cross-strait flights are still with us. And so what do you think, looking back now with the perspective of four years after Ma stepped down, what are the major accomplishments that are going to persist? Right. Uh, so next uh, for Austin, um, I'll keep this fairly short. I much your whole chapter is about the DPP's recovery since 2008. And when I was in Taiwan in 2008, I saw that election. It was astounding uh, just how poorly the DPP did, and it was also astounding how rapidly they recovered and and became competitive again in elections. And so. There's been a lot of talk about the KMT in Taiwan these days that they may be doomed, that they don't have a future in Taiwanese electoral politics. The DPP provides a roadmap for how an opposition party that's down might not be out and might actually be in a position to recover quickly. Do you think the KMT in 2024 uh, could follow a similar sort of path? In other words, do they have a Tsai Ing-wen kind of waiting to lead them back to power? Um, and then for Isaac, uh, for Shi Hao, I have um, uh, basically one big question, uh, and that is uh, your chapter argues, basically you provide great data that suggests the legislature, to put it very bluntly, is where presidential initiatives go to die, right? It's, it's a graveyard for the presidential, uh, for presidential um, priorities. Um, and my impression, in the Tsai Ing-wen era, the DPP era, is that fewer things have died in the legislature than they did in the Ma Ying-jeou era. Uh, so two-part question, is that accurate? Have Tsai Ing-wen been more successful with the legislature than Ma Ying-jeou was? Or is that a false impression? Uh, and if so, why has she been more successful? Is the DPP more unified or not? Um, and then uh, if you'd like to address it, I'm curious what you think will happen with the pork issue this month, whether the DPP will actually go on the record, vote to support Tsai Ing-wen's pork uh, changes, because Ma Ying-jeou struggled with this issue and his own legislative caucus uh, voted against him on this issue. So will the th same thing happen to Tsai or not? All right, so there's a lot of meat on the table. Let's go in the order that people presented. Uh, we'll start with Si Ying. All right, you just said that a lot of meat on the table, the, uh, uh, and upside. The, uh, uh, I remember that and, uh, most of my time spent and, uh, in uh, NSC you know, was about in the beef, you know, about yes. the pork, about the rapid toppling and the, all these things. You know. Okay, back to your question. Uh, your two questions you know, made me think of uh, how uh, the possibility or the uh, progress and uh, how and the president like Biden you know, would uh, revert, uh, reverse the revert reverse and some of the policies and uh, by President Trump you know? and uh, I think there are a lot of uh, 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 similar concerns here now uh, in Taiwan. Uh, I your qu first question uh, would be would be enough uh, for the uh, for the uh, say there is a new uh, KMT administration, would it 
it be enough now for the KMT say, okay, look, uh, let's go back and, uh, to the uh, 92 consensus and uh, have uh, happy days again. Uh, uh, it won't be that easy now. For one thing, now we, as we are all social scientists, and now we know the idea of um, path dependence. Now, uh, things have been done that cannot be uh, undone now, uh, in a moment. So that wouldn't be a uh, uh, that easy. Now, it would be actually a lot of difficult to rebuild and uh, trust and in, uh, in, uh, in in, in, in with China for Taiwan. Uh, we all know, I, as to my knowledge, you know, Taiwan for the past four years you now uh, has uh, pretty much alienated you know, the netizens you know, in China. So uh, China you know, is uh, well, almost the one mind of uh, well, taking back Taiwan by whatever means. You know, and uh, to ask China you know, to slow it down of this unification process you know, uh, would take a lot of time you know, to, uh, would take a lot of time you know, for the uh, new uh, KMT administration, should there be anyone. That is uh, my uh, first, uh, my, my answer to the first question. The second question is, uh, what would be the lasting impact you know, on, uh, of mind Joe's uh, cross strait policy you know, on Taiwan's future. You know, uh, one thing is for sure, you know, uh, the uh, 92 consensus uh, once was a password, but now the password you know, has become scrambled, so to speak. You know. So uh, the, uh, but the, the the problem is you now with this scrambled password. You now, how could China you now walk back you know, uh, uh, its current position you know, on uh, on ninety two consensus? You know, as Austin mentioned, I think I think it was Austin uh, mentioned or you, you know, mentioned in, uh, in uh, well, uh, Xi Jinping in twenty nineteen uh, January second said. You know, this 92 consensus you know, is, is all about you know, one China. Okay, look, you know, this is very much a, a scrambled password. You know. So China has to walk back. And uh, Taiwan uh, has to tell its people that, hey, this uh, say if there's a new 92 consensus, you know, this thing you know, is different from the old one, yet similar to the old one. You know. This uh, would take a lot of uh, effort you know, in signaling you now both across the Taiwan Strait and the domestically you now and uh, for so uh, I want to say this 92 consensus you now used by my joint administration would have a lasting impact you know, uh, on uh, Taiwan's uh, future you now because you now this is uh, a uh, a uh, a position uh, uh, crystallized you now by all the uh, by all parties, you know, especially Taiwan and China, you know, involved, you know. and uh, this has to do with uh, uh, the work of uh, symbolism you know, in politics. Difficult, you know, but this is going to be the lasting impact, you know, the major lasting impact of mind your administration on Taiwan's future. Great. Um, we will go a little long. I think we can go to about uh, five ten. So uh, I'll next turn the floor over to Austin. I'll, I want to make sure that we have time for a second round of questions. Uh, if you do have a question from the audience, I encourage you to type it into the box uh, at the bottom of your screen. Austin. Okay. So let me briefly explain what happened in two thousand eighteen and what will KMT do in twenty twenty. Right. So first, if we want to explain what happened in 2018, basically there are four factors. The first is, is about labor law, because the DPP tried to reform the labor law before 2018, but DPP flip-flopped its positions in 2017 and 2018. So if you reform, no, some people will, will feel unhappy, right? But if, if you reform twice and you change it, keep changing its position, then everyone will be unhappy. So it impact on DPP's popularity a lot for 2018. So it's the first issue. And the second is about referendum because in 2018, DPP tried to put referendum and the election on the same day. So if you hold a referendum, then you give the agenda setting power to others instead of the current government. So, so DPP cannot control how people discuss 
during the campaign. So it, it's a big deal to DPP. But so we know DPP removed the, 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 the split the referendum apart from the general election after this after this election. So, yeah, so but at least in 2018, it's a second issue. And the third is, is some story that I just I just heard in recent week. Yeah, so there are many uh, people who work in DPP before 2016, especially those who work in the media and creative center that helped Tsai won the election in 2016. But after Tsai won, Tsai won the election, most of them were, were, uh, went to the president's office. They, be, they became the confidential secretaries in many departments in the president's office. So they focus mostly on the inter-department de coordination instead of campaign. So before 2018, basically most of DPP members, they believe that they are become the president. So they will already have enough media coverage. So to some extent, they neglect the importance of internet campaign before 2018. Yeah, they're still doing the, the, the campaign, but internet campaign, but the campaign was not highly coordinated and it's not top down. And many of them, they simply become the secretaries and they no longer put more efforts in the internet campaign. And the last interesting factor is that uh, in 2018, five, uh, on May 2018, there is a discount uh, internet plan, which is called uh, Zhonghua Dianxin 499 Fang'an. And this affordable uh, unlimited plan increase the amount of internet users, which are over 50, increase 20%. And DPP neglect this part. DPP don't believe that it will cause a huge impact on the amount of old, old generation using the internet. And, and this voters, they start to use the smartphone and internet because of this plan. So they start to receive more information, mostly from Hangul's campaign. So they vote for Han because of this and KMT. Yeah, so DPP, they deeply, now DPP know this factor. So DPP, once again, they centralized their efforts on internet campaign after 2018, especially after Su Zhenchang become the premier. Okay, so the next question is about whether KMT can get into the power again, whether KMT have, have a tying one of their own. Right. So if we want to study this once again, it, now it's, it's, it's time, it's KMT's turn to get a new party brand because the 99 consensus might not be that as popular as before because uh, according to the new survey by the uh, Taiwan National Security Survey, now less than half or about half of Taiwanese people support the 99 consensus compared to before 2018. There's always about 60% of Taiwanese people support 99 consensus. So KMT might need a new brand. But now the, the Tsai Ing-wen already got a lot of issue, issue ownership, just like the uh, uh, containing the COVID-19, just like the Taiwan Taiwan uh, identity or even anti-China. So if KMT really want to get some, uh, to attract moderate voter, first thing KMT need to do is to have a new party brand, right? And and the second is that whether the current uh, KMT chairman, Zhang Jichen, can be the next Tsai Ing-wen. Well, I think that he, he faced some limitation. The first is that he planned to step down before the uh, May 2020, 21st. So he need to prove himself that he is a competitive between May 2020, between uh, before May 2021st, the first issue. But since Jiang Jichen become a new chairman, what he had already experienced, the first that came, he lose the, like, lose the recall action in Kaohsiung in 2020. It's the first issue, right? But there are some opportunity for Zhang Jishun because there's another another recall election that will happen next month. That is the uh, uh, DPP uh, local legislator Wang Hao's recall election that will took, take place in January 16. So it is a one chance that Zhang Jishun can probably prove himself as competitive. They can lead the party to defeat one famous uh, guy in DPP. Right. And the second is that uh, on August 2021, there is a reopen nuclear power plant referendum, which many KMT members they emphasize from several times, including uh, former President Ma ying and also uh, former uh, KMT chair and uh, presidential candidate, uh, candidate Hong Xiaoju. They all support the reopening the nuclear power plant in Taiwan. And so if, if KMT can make the best use of this referendum to prove that they are stand along with the people, the majority of people in Taiwan, then maybe the KMT can get a chance to prove themselves that they can also be moderate. They can find some other issue to represent the Taiwanese people. Yeah, so that is my re response. Okay, so that if you're a KMT member, you should not uh, lose all hope that you might 
be able to make a comeback at some point then. Mm -hmm. uh, so let me turn it over to uh, Shi Hao now. Okay, so I want to share the screen. I want to thank uh, Kyrie for his question. So um, the, the simple answer for the question is yes and no. Uh, so yes, uh, they are more successful. The DPP government, uh, the Taiwan government was more successful uh, compared to uh, the KMT government uh, in terms of getting their bills enacted in the Gazette Yuan. But uh, if you, uh, and indeed they actually uh, carry out some uh, decision, some important decision, and, but no, they do not, they, they did not, you know, carry out all the, get everything enacted in the legislative Yuan, right? So uh, look at in, uh, this table. So uh, the first turn of the Taiwan government uh, only enact 63% uh, of the government bill. So uh, it's 58% uh, uh, during the major first turn. So, Regarding the the in, enactment rates of the government bills, uh, they are uh, uh, the DPP can uh, enact only five percent more than the uh, Mindjo government. And so if you and if you compare with Chen Shui-bian and the Mindjo and Taiwan, so you will see that the change is only about five to ten percent to ten percent. So so uh, so even though uh, they can be more, the, the DPP is more cohesive and even, and I, I think one of the reasons why they are more success, why are, they were more successful is, uh, is that uh, they have, you know, the really skilled uh, party whip, Ke uh, Jianmin. So he knows every tricks uh, in getting the bills uh, moving faster in the legislative Yuan. And then, uh, but, uh, even though they have uh, all the skills, all the all the, uh, and and they have a higher uh, party cohesion, they can only enact like sixty percent of the bill. And so, compared to what we have seen in other democracies, right? So there, uh, so uh, the government there can enact like oh, uh, more than uh, seventy percent of the bills, and then they. Uh, Frustrated between you know seventy percent and the one hundred percent, but in in Taiwan we you know frustrated between you know forty percent and sixty percent. So the yes, they are more cohesive, but that's not you know they they are they are more successful, but that's not the you know the the, the same success that we observe in uh, in the in other democracies. So and then they have to pay a lot of mobilization costs. And uh, so they can, you know, so think about the uh, pork issue and the, and the uh, it is show, right? So if they can, they can, you know, uh, enact uh, uh, Labor Standard Act, strongly enact the Labor Standard Act, then why don't they do that for every bill, right? So, and then uh, if you know, if you uh, uh, watch the Taiwan's uh, press media, you can, you can see that the uh, DPP members have to uh, form a line in front of the legislative Yuan to get the chance, first the chance to propose the uh, uh, motion to change the agenda and motion to you know, reconsider, re reconsider the, uh, the bill. So they want to you know, take the first chance and then they can, they can vote it down and then the opposite party cannot get the, the chance to to propose that kind of motion, so they have to do all the things to uh, to 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 get there to protect their bills. But if you look in uh, look uh, UK or French or the um, even the United States, they don't need to do that. They, they can just yeah, control the agenda and then they preclude all the motion or all the amendments from the uh, floor. So that's the key difference, uh, and that's why we want to draw your attention to decentralized legislative the organization. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you, Shi Hao. So the, the lesson here is if you are the president of Taiwan, you really have to pick your battles with the legislature. <laughs> you can't expect to get everything you want, even if you've got a large majority of your own party there. And I think your data really 
really nail that point, hammer it home. Okay, so for the next round of questions, I'm gonna start with uh, the person who introduced me, uh, Dr. Larry Diamond, for the panelists. Great, uh, thank you, Kara. So I know our time is dwindling down, so maybe we could focus it on the future. Uh, and uh, the challenge that uh, Tsuyin posed in terms of demography, and I'll broaden it and shape it uh, in the following way. Um, there uh, is a demographic problem uh, in terms of uh, recruitment into the military and a demographic problem in terms of the, what we call the age dependency ratio for the economy. Tsuyin, uh spoke of both, uh, you know, it, it seems, I think, to some external friends of Taiwan, that if you look over the next decade, um, two things are probably going to need to happen and logical reaction to that. Uh, and I think our both are going to be uh, immensely difficult politically. So uh, this is a question that really spans the expertise on this panel, uh, national security and strategic on the one hand uh, and domestic politics on the other. Uh, I think uh, and have advocated for some time that Taiwan needs to prepare itself more in the mindset of Israel and institute uh, mandatory military service again, and not for a few months. I, I don't think that um, PRC uh, military planners are going to take Taiwan seriously in terms of a commitment to defend itself without an Israel-like commitment to full men and women uh, national service. And the second thing is, it's just pretty obvious to anybody who looks uh, that the only way you're going to um, reverse the unsustainable trends economically in terms of the age dependency ratio is by de importing people, uh, which is what Europe has been doing, what the United States has been doing since its birth, uh, and what even Japan is starting to do now. So I'd be interested in your reaction uh, to these thoughts and in in the political feasibility of doing either of these things. Great, and um, I would just add one thing that uh, got raised in the Q&A as well is that Taiwan has these demographic problems, but the PRC also faces similar demographic problems. They're not quite as far down uh, the line as Taiwan is, but do you expect that might change the calculus in cross-strait relations going forward as well? I guess both of these questions are for Cillian, so we'll turn it to him. Uh uh, that's the question first. Uh, uh, I don't think uh, uh, you, we, can, uh, we can take any comfort uh, in similar demographic trend happening uh, in China because uh, there's, uh, well, cross uh, uh when it comes to uh, military uh, power, uh, it's uh, a matter of, uh, I think, uh, uh, based on absolute assessment uh, rather than relative assessment. Uh, so uh, China is so much bigger and uh, so it doesn't matter uh, for me. Uh, uh, given uh, China's uh, demographic decline, uh, uh, Larry's uh, questions you know, are, 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 I think, uh, are the uh, ultimate uh, crucial uh, uh, factor uh, in determining Taiwan's uh, uh, national security. Uh, the first thing is, uh, can we follow ex Israel's example? Uh, uh, I don't think so. As long as the politicians uh, are demagogic, uh, I don't think uh, they will adopt uh, policies uh, of this kind uh, that would alienate the, 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 vote, the voters, uh, especially the young voters. Uh, and I don't think that is possible. Uh, for the second uh, question is, uh, can we import more people in the, the immigration? Uh, yes, we should uh, and we can. Uh, but the, then on the other hand, uh, people from where? 
naturally, you know, mainland China's uh, uh, people you know, are moving to Taiwan uh, by marriage or by immigration or would be the most welcome. But then the government would have to consider the possibility of the formation of a fifth column. Uh, so uh, you will have to have more immigrants now from uh, Southeast Asia, but the, the cost will be much higher now for Taiwan now, because now these immigrants now do not speak uh, well, 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 the native uh, Chinese. Now. So they, their, the education now, of uh, these immigrants as well as their offsprings. Now, well, well, the children uh, tend to speak in the mother's tongue. Now. So it would be very costly. Now. And uh, this uh, won't be easy. Now. Uh, there is actually now, a, a third, I think, uh, uh, patch up, uh, uh, a patch up approach now, to Taiwan's national security. That is you know, to convince China that, uh, well, I have to say that you know, from American perspective and from Taiwan's perspective, you know, Tsai Ing-wen uh, really has done a good job in maintaining the status quo. Yet you know, the status quo is in the eyes of beholder. China doesn't think so. So China is extremely suspicious you know, of Taiwan's uh, uh, the creeping uh, approach you know, to Taiwan independence. You know. And uh, China, well, after drawing the red line in the sand time and again, uh, couldn't use, uh, uh, couldn't use uh, uh, or force or, or, or the concrete steps you know, to back up its uh, 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 red line drawing. Uh, and uh, then Taiwan uh, would uh, be tempted uh, to move further toward uh, the Taiwan independence end. Uh, so the thing is, uh, how to convince China that uh, we are indeed uh, uh, maintaining the status quo. Now, this is important uh, for Taiwan's uh, national security in the short run. But the, the patch up approach you know, will not be enough uh, to solve uh, uh, the, uh, the, the the, the uh, Larry's uh, questions, that is you know, long-term national security, the patch up will not be enough. All right, thank you, Suyin. Um, we are way over time. And so I apologize to the people who've submitted questions that are still in the queue, but we do have to wrap up. Uh, I wanna thank our presenters again for uh, joining us this afternoon here in the Bay Area. Um, and I'd like to remind our audience once again, uh, the book is called Dynamics of Democracy in Taiwan, The Ma Yingzhou Years. You can purchase it on Amazon or preferably from our publisher, Lynn Reiner Publishing. Um, any last words, uh, Larry? I thank our contributors uh, today and in the book, and I thank you for moderating this session. Great. Great. Um, all right. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day over there in Taiwan, folks. And uh, I hope to see you again soon for our next event. All right. Okay. Okay, bye bye. You. Bye bye.